collective understanding of innovation is wrong. It may at first seem like problems are solved and innovations are created by a single point of light, a lone person having a eureka moment. However, we can see that for all of the annals of history, this is simply not true. For instance, let's look at the history of who invented the computer. It may at first seem linear, like a single event or implementation was the start. However, it was not one, but many steps forward. Maybe under certain def definitions, it was the ENIAC. It was the first digital programmable computer, and it had a lot of features all in one place. That said, it wasn't binary. Colossus also was regarded as the world's first programmable computer, but it was programmed by switches and knobs and not a stored program. Binary being pretty important, maybe we want to trace it to Aikens Mark I or Z3 and Z4, or Atenasoff and Barry, uh, uh, who could store on information on main memory. But none of these would be possible without Turing writing on computable numbers, evolving theory, and thinking about Turing machines, or Claude Shannon thinking about information theory, but also EDVAC, Manchester Baby, the Ferranti Mark I, IBM, they all brought new innovations to bear. But none of this would have been possible without Jacquard's loom, which was a set of cards to produce a weave and a cloth, or Babbage, who created the difference engine and analytical machine, or Ada Lovelace, who invented the concepts of modern computers, including software and subroutines. But then, this really does depend on what your definition of a computer is, because what would a computer be without a computer chip? Or a mouse or a GUI? Or the ethernet for commu communicating between computers and hardware? As Matt Ridley says in How Innovation Works, the invention of a computer can no more be pinpointed to a single moment in time than you can pinpoint the moment a child becomes an adult. For even with all these pieces, we can see that they are interconnected, not just on a linear time scale, but also connected by the spectrum for which they bring everything forward. And thus, we see that innovation is a system. It is a series of interconnected frequencies. It is a network. Innovation at a large scale is slow, cumulative, and inevitable. We often talk about the waves of JavaScript frameworks, that single moment where a JavaScript framework hits massive relevance, but we don't talk about what makes a wave. Waves aren't created on their own. They're created by forces of nature, like the wind. And so today, as we talk about innovation in the industry, we're gonna talk about the wind and the waves. I'm Sarah Drasner. So who am I to talk about any of this stuff anyway? Uh, back in the day, I was a React developer. I keynoted React Rally in 2016. I worked very closely with the core team on some things, and uh, I was at a bunch of different conferences, and then I found Vue. And I became very enamored with Vue, and I became a core team member of Vue. Um, and three years ago, I became Senior Director of Engineering at Google, where I run, now run web, Android, iOS, and multi-platform infrastructure for Google. So all the core infrastructure that the apps work off of. Um, and under that organization, there are a few different frameworks, one of which is Angular. So I don't personally run the Angular team. You can think of me like Angular's grandma. Um, <laughs> Today, I'm going to focus on Angular, but know that I could tell this same story from the perspective of any framework in the industry, because we all really do learn from one another. And when I see other frameworks out there thriving, I feel happy for them too. So that leads me to, how do we all get here? In order to see where it's going, we need to see where we came from, but in order to do that, I have to enter territory with a warning, with flames, <laughs> because this is a contentious area and people have strong opinions on some of these things, so we might not agree on all of these points. So remember how I said that innovation was more like a network than it was in, or a system than it was things coming out of thin air? So AngularJS was uh, in that first framework wave, that's the, the initial version of Angular, but it 
thought through things based on things that weren't really JavaScript frameworks, Rails and jQuery. And it got a lot of those MVC approaches from things like that. Ember also derived some of that, both from Angular and Rails, and also Handlebars, which Yehuda Katz worked on there, and he also worked on, um, on the Ember core team. And Backbone was also learning from Rails, but then Angular learned from Backbone. And Knockout learned from jQuery and Handlebars. React learned from a lot of things. It took a lot of these MVC approaches and it removed the M and the C, the model and controller, and it focused on the view layer only, which was really unique. It also was inspired by things in Backbone and Elm for Redux, some of those flux premises. Angular, of course, was inspired by itself from the first wave and also React. And Vue was inspired by so many things. Angular for directives, React for Vue layer only, Knockout for computed properties, and Elm as well for things like Vuex and then Pina. Svelte was also inspired by so many things that came before it, but it moved forward in a lot of different ways, focusing on simplicity, moving into the compiler, which then React was very inspired by. Now, I'm going to mention a thing called Wiz, which you might not have heard about. It's a framework internal to Google. And it's not open source, but Search, Workspace, and YouTube all rely on it. And the reason why I'm going to bring it up is for two reasons. One is that Wiz and Angular are now converging. We're converging them. And the other is that you might have heard of a framework called Quick that Mishko works on. He learned a lot of his premises from Wiz. And so you're going to see some things today that are inspired by Wiz and are also being brought into Wiz. And Solid has thought up a lot of really amazing reactivity premises, a lot of which Angular is actually working with. We work with Ryan Carnado on some of those things today, so I'm going to talk about some of those as well. Now, you can see a bunch of question marks up top. I'm not a weatherman. I'm not going to tell you what the next wave of JavaScript frameworks are. That's up to your discernment. Um, but I do think it's interesting to think about. And I know I'm basically this meme when I go through all of these different patterns and things. Now, I mentioned that Angular has lasted a really long time. And it, Angular has invented a lot of things that might be hard to see because sands of time just tend to wash these things away. Angular developed spas. It, it used the first class use of TypeScript, uh, first test integration and harnesses, tree shaking, ahead of time compilation, and the first built-in internationalization, and mature CLI-driven updates. Microsoft actually attributes the takeoff of TypeScript to Angular's use of it. So that brings us to today. Angular is currently inspired by so many different uh, frameworks. Svelte, Simplicity, Solids, Reactivity, React's authoring, Svelte stores and state management, Views approach to single file components, the list goes on. So we're going to talk about a few new features that I'm really excited about. One of them is signals for reactivity. I just love reactivity. Um, another one is lazy loading and incremental hydration. Another one is migration tooling, which people don't often talk about, and then also better developer experience. So let's talk about signals for reactivity first. This one I find particularly exciting. So I built this demo you can play with. We want to set up any data that we want to track with a signal. A signal is a value which is reactive, meaning it can notify all the consumers when it changes. So signals are zero function ar arguments that return the current value of the signal. So if you want to update the users, we can set that amount. We can also continuously update them as they come onto the platform. You can do that via settable signal. And we just talked about set and update. There's also mutate as well. Now on to compute, which is my favorite. There are a few pieces of data that are derived from other pieces in the signals. Computed values are really performant because they're cached based on dependencies, and they only update when uh, necessary. Lastly, effect. We can schedule and run a side effect full function. And in this, we're updating all of those lines. You can see them being redrawn and recalculated. Truly, there's just so much to play around with with signals, and we're actually integrating them further and further into the framework. So you can check out this demo and code here. And though must, 
Though mo a lot of what Angular is working on is unique, such as fast-tracking DOM updates, a lot was gleaned from Solid, as I mentioned. We worked with Ryan Carnado. Solid has a very similar concept of signals. Uh, the API layer is different in Solid. It's a li little bit more React-like. Um, but we owe a lot to partnering with Ryan on this feature. Vue has some sim similar concepts for reactivity, but it leverages a thing called proxies, which are a modern JS feature. I actually, funnily enough, wrote the first version of these talks, ironically. Um, Mishko, who's the maker of Quick, actually wrote this great post that's a very comprehensive uh, history of all of the different types of reactivity. It's really interesting because of his current work and also because he was the inventor of Angular, so definitely worth checking out. So, our Angular Signals implementation are, is actually now ported over to Wiz inside Google. So it now powers all of the apps, including YouTube and things like that. Um, so we believe really strongly in this primitive. So Wiz is also learning from Angular as well. And as of this release, there's also two-way binding with, with Signals, which is really nice. It allows for very good DX and performant DX with forms. So let's talk about lazy loading and incremental hydration. As you may know, Google and its properties are really on the hook to provide in, uh, incomparable performance. So Angular supports server-side rendering, but recently we took that a step further with deferrable views. So let's look at an example of that. So declarative lazy loading allows you to specify what part of your template you'd like to load lazily. The framework extracts the template segment and all of its transitive dependencies and puts that in a separate bundle. So in this example, we download and partially hydrate only the components used outside the lazy block. And then when it's loading, we show the indicator. And when there's the error block, we show that. And this concept might, have, might remind you of some of React's lazy and suspense um, implementations. The only difference is that Node.js is loaded by default in this implementation. And it also might remind you of Astro's Islands, which was a big uh, pre precursor and inspiration for this way of loading. Which leads us next to incremental hydration. Partially hydrating a page adds significant performance boosts because you can have an, a really small initial bundle size. So you can have really reduced latency. And this is really important, especially when you have finite control of the sequencing. So if you're confused about what partial hydration means, you're not alone. Everyone in the framework landscape uses a different term and a different way of talking about it. And it's all slightly differently implemented. Most uh, implementations across all of the framework landscapes, though, don't have, they have something that's offered, but they don't have it baked into the core of the framework, and a lot of these features are in experimental mode. Um, so, Angular's learning from others, but I actually think that Angular is kind of ahead in, one of, in, in this case. I wouldn't say that about just everything. I do think that this is one thing that's very unique. So, Here's this demo, and it's grayscaled. We're not hydrated. When we touch the nav, it's hydrated and colored in. This implementation also allows defer blocks as these hydration boundaries that trigger the, de the fetching of these deferred resources. And the key difference between the defer blocks that you see is how we render those things on the server. So this is what that code looks like. You can see we say we have a defer block. It says defer on idle, hydrate on interaction. That's pretty straightforward. Um, we can also uh, nest them, so we can actually put them one within another. And so here's on immediate, hydrate on viewport. So imagine you have scrolling that you're going to do. It doesn't hydrate until it's in the viewport view, and then we can nest to hydrate in, in interaction. And under the hood, this leverages a thing called JS Action, which is invented in Wiz and inspired and leveraged by Angular and Quick. So first we add the event dispatch script to the head that's inlined, then we register global event handlers, then we add JS Action attributes for eager updates and replay, and then we add JS Action uh, at the end. So this allows us to have all of these rich trigger, triggers that can then be added and also refreshed and re-updated and the event can be replayed. So there's all of these rich set of uh, triggers. I've highlighted some of the non-event based triggers here. And some of the APIs that we leverage under the hood may be familiar with to you, like idle uses request idle callback, viewport uses intersection observer, and timeout uses set timeout. 
Okay, so let's talk about migration tooling. Um, Google has this thing called a single version policy. That means internally, that means that you can't have other versions of frameworks and, and tools and libraries laying around. You have to migrate the entire depot to one single version. Um, this means you also have to have really good tooling to support it and upgrade millions of lines of code for the entire depot. If you have a really large application and you don't upgrade to new versions, basically what happens is you can leave around lots of old API bits. And what, it ha what happens is you kind of build up this tech debt. You can kind of force junior engineers to have to learn every version of the framework that came before. So you have to learn every type of that framework in every way that it's ever been made. So the upgrades do help keep the code clean and salient, and also keep training the junior devs very easily and readily. Angular offers a thing called ng-update. This is a CLI tool that allows for some of these migrations, so it migrates the, to the new version for you, and it will pause if it sees anything that, of note or let you know if there's any errors. But recently, we started doing a new thing where we're leveraging another tool as well. So, in addition to ng-update. Now, this is really experimental, so play with it at your own risk. Um, the GitHub, uh, the repo is up open source on GitHub, but it is definitely in experimental mode. So, T-Surge was created because current tools for migrations can't track references between compilation units. So, T-Surge fixes this problem by introducing a way to compute global analysis metadata on all of the compilation units and leverage that as a final step towards migration changes and replacements. So this is a really innovative offering in a space that's kind of critical and also pretty overlooked. And it also saves people a ton of time and developer toil and energy. So finally, we get to better developer experience. Angular's been around for a long time, so for after a long time, the API starts looking old and it needed some modernization. It needed to get, get rid of a lot of the boilerplate, get rid of a lot of the code that we have to write in order to build applications. So Angular conditionals, previously more verbose, are now be, becoming more simplified. And we truly do this all over the place. So we have all of these improvements rolling out, streamlining all of these APIs. For instance, the one on the left, that's all you need to do in order to set up routing now. Now, I have an inherent bias for the view docs. I think that they're quite excellent. Um, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to work on them. Um, and so when I started working with the Angular team, I hired some of the people from the view docs team <laughs> to come work on the Angular docs. So here are the old Angular docs, and here is the revamp of the Angular documentation. So now there's code sandboxes, and playgrounds, and new examples, and better explanations. And we're also doing a bit of design, or uh, docs-driven development as well, where if something doesn't make sense as we're writing it, we're starting to question and see if we can improve the framework based on that too. So that brings us to the future. We have a bunch of things coming up. Um, some of them are things like better DevEx, continuing some of the things that I was just talking about, simplified APIs, better dependency injection, which is going to be much better for performance. We have speed of development, like edit refresh cycles, things like that. Zooming in on some testing experiences. And more reactivity, so get making sure that signals are baked into other things, like forms and router improvements and the like. So what I presented today is really the tip of the iceberg of what's under development now. And there are really larger strides forward, not just for Angular, but for the entire framework landscape. There's an avalanche of innovation across this in industry. So Angular both, both pushes the web framework ecosystem forward and it also learns from and is inspired by frameworks around it. And this is how we all evolve. It is never in isolation. It is always from learning from each other. Thank you.